Have you ever heard whispers that things like white bread, sweet treats, and dairy might not be doing your body any favors? I'd wager there's at least one person in your circle who's mentioned they're cutting these out for an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. You might be wondering, can what we eat spark inflammation within us? What's the real risk here? And if it's true, is there a magical bite that keeps the inflammation at bay? Today, we're diving into these burning questions in our latest episode on all things nutritional. You'll be intrigued to find out that defending against inflammation doesn't mean you have to say goodbye to all your favorite treats. But before we get into the nitty-gritty of inflammatory foods, we must get a handle on what inflammation is all about. Inflammation is a bit like the body's own security system, kicking into action to defend us, and it's not always the villain of the story. Let's take John's little incident as an example. One fine day, John, not paying much attention, smacks his pinky toe against the bed frame. Ouch. His toe turns red, swells up, and throbs with pain. What's happening inside John's pinky toe is an acute inflammatory response. When hundreds of cells in his toe get damaged, they immediately release substances that signal something's amiss. Among these substances are inflammatory mediators. These mediators call on the body's defense cells and increase blood flow to speed up their arrival. John notices his toe swelling and pulsating. This increased blood circulation is due to a natural inflammatory process to clean up the damaged cells. Once the defense cells see there's no longer anything to fight off or clean up, the inflammatory mediators stop calling for backup, and everything gradually returns to how it was. Similar dynamics unfold when a virus or bacterium makes its way into the body. This unwelcome guest is quickly identified as an outsider prompting affected cells to release signals that draw in the immune system's defense troops, kickstarting inflammation at the site of the invasion. The immune cells spring into action, and if all goes well, they manage to quash the infection. So, you might wonder, how does all this relate to nutrition? Are we suggesting that a single food item could trigger such a response in the body? When do foods become inflammatory agents? Take Jane's case as an example. She has celiac disease, a form of gluten intolerance. Due to her genetic makeup, her body can't process gliadin, a protein found in gluten. Her immune system flags gliadin as an invader. When Jane consumes gluten-containing foods, her immune system not only targets gliadin but also assaults her intestinal cells, impairing nutrient absorption and causing uncomfortable symptoms like bloating and pain. This is the reason individuals diagnosed with celiac disease must steer clear of any food containing gluten, such as wheat and bread, pasta, and a myriad of other items. This situation differs from those who have gluten sensitivity, where the problem lies in poor absorption. In contrast, Jane's system initiates an inflammatory reaction each time gluten is present. Similarly, inflammation can be triggered by allergies to common foods like wheat or dairy. To differentiate between an allergy, intolerance, or a genetic disorder, a visit to a specialist, like a gastroenterologist, is crucial for accurate identification. So, we're on the same page understanding that certain foods are off-limits for some due to the immediate, noticeable inflammatory reactions they cause. Yet, there's a sneakier, slow-building type of inflammation that doesn't announce itself as quickly as allergies or autoimmune diseases such as celiac. It's this under-the-radar inflammation that brings us to the heart of the discussion on inflammatory foods. Imagine you're at the top of your game career-wise, with a track record of eating well and staying active. Then, out of the blue, your company offers you the chance to move to a new city for work, and you jump at the chance. Exciting, right? The catch, your health routine takes a nosedive. Suddenly, you don't have time for your workouts, and you're eating at a place where the food leans heavily on the greasy side, day in and day out. Like anyone would, you notice a few months and that you've started to put on weight. It's expected. When we consume more calories than we burn, our body switches on a fascinating process. Our fat cells, which are incredibly efficient at storing any excess energy from our calorie intake, begin to grow in size. However, if this pattern persists, these cells might struggle to expand further and enter a state of distress. Scientists have observed that, in this state, fat cells start releasing inflammation markers day after day. In essence, the combination of a calorie-heavy diet and a lack of physical activity leads to inflammation. In this scenario, we're dealing with a type of inflammation that's not the quick, sharp response you get from a minor mishap like stubbing your toe, 
nor is it akin to the immune system's fight against gluten and celiac disease or an allergic reaction to dairy. We're talking about a low-grade, chronic inflammation that creeps up and settles in over time, much like an unwelcome guest who doesn't show themselves out. This long-term inflammation is also a common factor in chronic conditions such as diabetes, as well as in individuals grappling with elevated cholesterol and triglyceride levels. This slow burn inflammation can quietly compromise cells for years, setting the stage for significant health issues down the line. And what makes it particularly stealthy is its silent operation. No pain. No immediate signs of distress. So, indeed, the way we eat can stir up this smoldering kind of inflammation. But here's a silver lining. The inflammatory state of our bodies isn't tied to just one type of food or indulgence, but to the collective impact of our dietary habits. Let's consider the usual suspects like sugar and heavily processed fare, often pegged as inflammatory villains. These culprits are known to hike the risk for conditions like overweight and obesity, which in turn, fan the flames of chronic inflammation. But let's get something straight. We're talking about reaching a state of chronic inflammation through consistent excess within an unbalanced diet, not from the occasional indulgence in a few squares of chocolate after a day of eating fruits and vegetables and staying active. It's not the sugar cube or slice of ham that's inherently inflammatory, it's the link to overweight and obesity that matters. Now, I know you've likely been bombarded with talks of anti-inflammatory foods and might be anticipating a laundry list of do's and don'ts. Hang tight, that list is coming. But after diving into the nitty-gritty of diet-induced inflammation, surely this insight deserves a thumbs up, right? So, can we armor ourselves against inflammation with an anti-inflammatory diet? As you might guess, one of the cornerstone strategies for fostering an anti-inflammatory diet is quite straightforward, keeping a lid on body fat accumulation. The most effective way to achieve this is through a balanced diet, mindful of caloric intake relative to what might lead to weight gain. Equally critical are regular physical activity and stress management, Considering stress can often lead us to eat more than our hunger demands. Consider this. Any eating plan that's effective in regulating blood sugar and keeping cholesterol and triglyceride levels in check essentially doubles as an anti-inflammatory ally. This is because such diets tackle inflammation right at their source, helping to dodge the pitfalls of becoming overweight or obese. Now, onto the topic of so-called anti-inflammatory superfoods. Yes, there's a kernel of truth there. Take for example, the case of curcumin, the powerhouse molecule found in turmeric, that brilliant golden-hued spice. It's been spotlighted for its anti-inflammatory prowess. But here's the twist, embarking on a quest to lace every meal with turmeric, believing it's a silver bullet against inflammation, might not hit the mark as expected. Remember, our bodies don't operate like petri dishes or experimental subjects. Intriguingly, the journey from ingesting curcumin to having it actively engage with our cells demonstrates that only a fraction makes it through to where it's needed. Most of it is expelled from the body. To truly gauge whether turmeric holds anti-inflammatory benefits for humans, we require randomized clinical trials, and so far, the evidence on whether curcumin can reach the bloodstream in sufficient amounts to be effective is mixed. This uncertainty extends across the board to all those anti-inflammatory foods you've likely encountered. Grapes, with their resveratrol, green tea, rich in epigallocatechin, apples, packed with quercetin, plums, strawberries, and again grapes, brimming with anthocyanins, and even cinnamon, which contains cinnamaldehyde. Have any of these anti-inflammatory foods come across your radar before? Drop a comment below. While these foods have demonstrated anti-inflammatory effects in cellular and animal models, science is still on the hunt for a way to deliver these compounds more effectively into human blood circulation for them to have an impact. So, does this mean the buzz around anti-inflammatory foods is just a myth? Not exactly. There's an exciting and emerging field of science exploring how the bacteria in our gut can regulate the body's inflammation. The mix of bacterial populations in our intestines can play a significant role in our susceptibility to infections and, consequently, inflammation. What's fascinating is that research has uncovered certain types of bacteria that fail to protect our gut adequately, leading to increased toxin absorption and making us more prone to immune reactions and inflammation. In other words, having these specific bacteria might heighten your risk of inflammation. 
But here's the hopeful part. Science has also demonstrated that through our diet, we can influence which types of bacteria thrive within us, promoting beneficial bacteria over harmful ones. Foods themselves aren't inherently anti-inflammatory. However, they can support the growth of bacteria that help lower inflammation in our bodies. Isn't it fascinating? You can foster this balance of gut bacteria through a diet rich in fibers, which are plentiful in a variety of fruits and vegetables, whole cereals, and legumes, such as beans and lentils. But the story doesn't end with fiber. The beneficial compounds in those foods we've talked about play their part too, from the resveratrol in grape juice to the curcumin in turmeric, influencing our gut environment rather than serving as direct anti-inflammatory agents. The takeaway here is that an anti-inflammatory lifestyle isn't about drastic exclusions, like completely removing flour and dairy from your diet or banning your beloved chocolate indulgence. Think of an anti-inflammatory diet as one that simply ensures you're getting the right balance of calories, nutrients, and beneficial bioactive elements. It's a gentle reminder that maintaining such a diet is more straightforward and accessible than one might think perfect for easing the worries of anyone caught up in dietary complexities. Curious to learn more about how your dietary choices can impact your health and happiness? Don't miss out on our upcoming videos that delve deeper into the world of nutrition and well-being. Subscribe to our channel for a healthier, happier you.